interwoven with every activity is the common thread of Mao Zedong thought. During President Richard Nixon's visit in 1972, American journalists had gotten a tantalizing glimpse of China. But after Nixon's departure, the power struggle between moderates like Premier Zhou Enlai and radical ideologues led by Chairman Mao's wife, Zhang Qing, who became known as the Gang of Four, intensified. U.S. reporters were again stuck on the outside, forced to watch China from Hong Kong. Steve Bell was ABC's Hong Kong correspondent from 1972 to 74. All you could do when you were a so-called China watcher in Hong Kong was to get these very broken up TV broadcasts from what was then Canton TV. Bruce Dunning was then a correspondent in Asia for CBS. The images were terrible. They were black and white and uh, in terrible condition, but Usually that was all the picture we had out of China. It was like uh, a Ouija board. You were always searching for a reality, and there were a lot of conflicting signals. In those years, only one North American news organization was allowed to station a correspondent in Beijing, Canada's leading paper, the Toronto Globe and Mail. From 1971 to 75, its reporter was Englishman John Burns. When I was the Globe Mail correspondent, I was also de facto the New York Times right. correspondent because having no correspondent, there was a syndication agreement. Mm -hmm. So from the get-go, from the moment I landed in China, mm -hmm. I was, if there was something about the goings-on in mainland China mm -hmm. in the New York Times, it was going to appear under my byline. Although based in the Chinese capital, Burns too struggled to put the pieces of the China puzzle together. If the story is a 2,500-piece jigsaw, you will only have, at best, probably a few hundred pieces of that jigsaw. Meanwhile, in the spring of 1973, the U.S. opened a liaison office in Beijing. Soon after came invitations for the three American TV networks to send crews to China. Irv Drasnan was a producer for CBS News. It was filmed in two months during the summer of 1973. That is the longest stay any American observer has been permitted in this city that was once dominated by foreigners. This is the first time they have let American television journalists come to China except to cover Nixon's visit. They let each of the networks in to make a documentary, one documentary. In 1972, at the time of the Nixon visit, Drasnan, who'd studied Chinese at Harvard, had produced a controversial documentary called Misunderstanding China, narrated by Charles Kuralt. No ticky, no washy. One from column A and one from column B and a fortune cookie. You'll be hungry an hour later. That is about as much as we know about the Chinese. My original title for Misunderstanding China was The Yellow Peril and Other Things We Think We Know About China. Cooler heads prevailed and it became Misunderstanding China, which, um, which worked perfectly because into, um, into each commercial break, during the broadcast, the announcer would say, misunderstanding China will continue after this message, which was certainly true. Genghis Khan leads the East against the world. The film was an exploration of popular American attitudes and stereotypes of China. The history of our attitudes toward China. And that's what we're going to talk about during the rest of this broadcast. This is a funny story and a dismaying one. And not a trivial story either. As you will see, the history of attitudes has a lot to do with the history of events. What we think about something naturally influences what we do about it. It was a frightening idea for Americans. The yellow peril had merged with the red peril. The point here is not history. The point is how fast our thinking changed. The GIs battle the new elements with everything they have. 
Now, in the wake of the Nixon visit, American attitudes shaped by the media were shifting again. If you ever want to see the influence of the media, uh, just look at American-China uh, relations between 72 uh, and 73. I think the 72 Nixon trip was pure television, and it had an enormous impact on Americans. In a way, it went from being mindless hordes uh, coming over snow-capped mountains in Korea, killing Americans with no fear of death, to almost a warm, cuddly picture of Chinese civilians and, and the Chinese people in general. It was a huge shift. Yet the gulf between Americans and Chinese remained enormous, as Drasden and his team discovered while shooting their documentary, A Look at the City of Shanghai, in 1973. We were the curiosities in China. I mean, here are these Americans. These, they just weren't foreigners, they were Americans uh, with their camera crew. And one of these Americans had hair down to his shoulders. We would go out on the street and we would be surrounded. We would be surrounded, the equipment would be surrounded. People would just press in on us. They wanted to get a look at us. We literally couldn't move. CBS reports, Shanghai. After two months in China, Drasnin's documentary on Shanghai offered a more nuanced picture of China than most Americans had seen. All parents everywhere have hopes and dreams for their children. What hopes and dreams do you have for your son? <laughs> We do have hopes for him. I wish he could become an actor, because I myself worked in the field of literature and art, so it might influence him. As the CBS team left, ABC News correspondents Ted Koppel and Steve Bell arrived for a 10-week stay. What we proposed was that we would, we would try to find sort of different categories of people. So we had the military category, we had the student category, we had the worker-peasant category, which of course is how the, the Chinese themselves during the Cultural Revolution, everybody was a worker-peasant, soldier-peasant, you know, whatever the hell it was, they were, it was always this hyphenated kind of person. Interwoven with every activity is the common thread of Mao Zedong thought. Like Drasnin's CBS crew, Koppel and Bell found themselves tightly controlled. It wasn't bad, but we were, we were very carefully watched at all times. They had pre-selected the, uh, the people that we would be allowed to talk to and interview. Although the chaos of the Cultural Revolution had subsided, relentless ideological indoctrination still dominated Chinese life. Every one of the students in 1973 spoke pure Mao speak uh, without any effort whatsoever. Uh, it really was the way they had to talk to each other. The most uh, sort of shattering image was of the relationship between the, they, they let us go into an English class at the university, the relationship between the students and the professor. The professor was a woman, I would guesstimate, in her late 30s, early 40s. And she was clearly terrified of her students. Does it make it more difficult for you as a teacher to know that if you make mistakes, your students will severely criticize you? Sometimes I, will, I will felt ashamed and uh, would blush, uh, and I felt that I have I had lost my faith at the very beginning. But gradually, I found that the students criticized me only for the sake of helping me. And then we came back about a month or six weeks later, and they were all out participating in the cotton harvest. And there was the teacher. And I stopped to ask her, you know, isn't this sort of, I mean, don't you feel a little bit awkward doing this. You're an academic. You're an intellectual. Do you really feel you have a good identification now with the lower middle peasants? <laughs> I can hardly say. 
I, I think I, I'm doing my best to learn from the workers and the peasants. She was scared out of her mind. 32 years later, Steve Bell went back to China and found three of the students he and Koppel had interviewed in 1973, as well as the teacher. She told me that she came from a prominent pre-revolutionary family uh, that had been accused of bourgeois ideas during the Cultural Revolution. And she was extremely fearful as a teacher. And she said, we would wake up every morning and I would look out the window to see if there were posters uh, criticizing me. Uh, and I was scared to death. Everything you said, you had to think about it first. Otherwise, you'll be criticized and, uh, and the consequences would be very serious. Not only yourself, <laughs> but your family. The former students said, we were so naive we, we had no idea what was really going on. A lot of political pressure. I mean, what do you think? I mean, the, the, all the textbooks are quotations. I then did an interview with all of them together, and she retold that story, and they were, they were completely fla flabbergasted. And when the interview ended, uh, the young woman who had been a student who was sitting right next to her put her hand on the teacher's knee and said, we are so sorry. We didn't know. We are so sorry. The first thing I did was turn to make sure the cameraman was still rolling because that was the, that was the moment, uh, the most enlightening moment that I've ever had in China. The ABC documentary aired in December 1973, but the program infuriated the radicals in the Chinese leadership. Koppel and Bell's interpreter, Li Dan, paid the price. I remember some of the music we used was a bit ominous, uh, and there were pictures of Mao with this ominous music as we tried to put the Cultural Revolution into perspective. and. Uh, that was heavily criticized by the Gang of Four, and that's what led our uh, interpreter, Lee Don, to be sent to the re-education camp. It was more than a year before Lee Don was freed. In that year, the power struggle within the leadership intensified. As the only reporter for a North American news organization in Beijing, the Toronto Globe and Mail's John Burns got the occasional glimpse. You could go to the airport, for example, um, for heads of state arrivals uh, and the Politburo would turn out if it was an important head of state and there were slightly curious figures like uh, Haile Selassie, the Emperor of Ethiopia, I recall, um, who you might not think would be in the, uh, on the A-list of visiting heads of state but was very important to China because he was a bridge to Africa. And the whole Politburo would be there uh, but it was visibly divided. Uh, then there were two groups. There was the Gang of Four, the Four, Jiang Jing, and the other three. Uh, then there was the other group, most of them much uh, more venerated in the history of the Communist Party, older men. Um, and between them, there would be somebody commuting physically on the airport apron, and the person commuting between the two was Zhou and Lai. Uh, you didn't have to be uh, a sinologist of 50 years standing to understand what was going on there. Henry Bradshaw was then the Hong Kong correspondent for the now defunct Washington Star. I, by that time, was writing it very hard and saying that there was definitely a new split within the government. There was contention in the government, there was disagreement, there was a fight going on, and I wrote that day-to-day -day in newspaper reports. With normalization talks between the U.S. and China deadlocked over the issue of American support for Taiwan, Henry Kissinger, in particular, was upset with articles reporting discord within the Chinese leadership. Kissinger, on a couple of occasions, tried to keep my editors from publishing some of my articles. He'd call up the editor of the Washington Star and say, hey, you don't want to really publish this, this isn't right. I Kissinger was, you know, didn't want anybody looking like his policy was maybe wrong that, or it was a misunderstanding of what was really happening in China. In Beijing, too, there was anger at Bradshaw's reporting. After I'd written writing these articles very hard in the spring of 74, 
a couple of um, non-American journalists in Beijing who visited Beijing, a BBC man, and I forget who the other one represented, in the foreign ministry in Beijing were told that the, everything's fine here, you know, unity, peaceful, and the Hong Kong journalists are a despicable bunch, and Bradshaw is the most despicable of them all, you know, he's seeing, he's seeing things that aren't there. Sent down the word. Bradshaw is the most despicable of them all, and he will never be allowed to visit China again. That was the direct message I got from two different, two different channels. John Burns repeatedly got the message directly from angry Chinese officials. I got used to telephone calls at 3, 4 in the morning from a uh, distant and very chilly voice saying, you will be in the foreign ministry 3 a.m., 4 a.m., and um, I would drive down through utterly deserted streets and park my Volkswagen Beetle um, in the compound, the foreign ministry compound, and go to an empty room, empty safe for a portion of a mile, sometimes wait for several hours alone one wooden chair, um, and in would come the reproving officers of the state, very often from the information department of the foreign ministry, which was very closely allied with Chinese security. And the address shouted at me by somebody in a mouse suit, the shrill voice was almost always the same. Um, you have insulted the leadership of the People's Republic of China. You have abused the hospitality of the people of the People's Republic of China. Um, and these are most grave matters. Do you have anything to say? Richard Bernstein, who'd studied Chinese at Harvard, was then writing about China for Time magazine from New York. We understood that there was a power struggle, which the Chinese uh, propaganda machine uh, uh, vigorously denied all those years and denounced all this Western reporting that talked about divisions in the leadership and stuff like that, when in fact there was an absolute vicious power struggle going on. Bernard Kalb had been a longtime Asia correspondent for CBS. I think uh, altogether you'd have to say there was a sophisticated skepticism on the part of the media about how to report China. Joseph Lelyveld became the New York Times Hong Kong correspondent in 1973, expecting to go to China. I sort of figured China would be open because Nixon had gone, and after the election, China would open, right? But it didn't. So that's how I wound up in Hong Kong as a China watcher. Stuck in the British colony, Lelyveld relied heavily on sources at the U.S. consulate. Raymond Burkhardt served at the consulate in the mid-70s. We had a Chinese employee named Vincent Lowe, who was famous because he, he and, and some of his colleagues who were in the China watching business uh, could look at a photograph and could tell you immediately, or look at a list of, from people who were named, named to the Central Committee, and they would tell you, oh, well, this guy served in the Third Field Army with him, so, that, so of course he's there, you know? And the location of those two people in the photographs reflects the fact that they were together in 1928 in Hunan, you know? And, and they were right, you know? This, this, stuff, this stuff tended, to, tended to, to, uh, to bear out in terms of who was up and down and how people related to each other. Vincent and I would meet about twice a week for lunch in the Clipper Lounge of the Mandarin Hotel. I'd have to walk two blocks to the Clipper Lounge and walk two blocks back to my office. It was quite enjoyable because I liked, his, I liked him, I liked his mind, uh, I liked the game. I, I had expected to hate China watching, and it turned out I didn't because there were little mysteries you could get into, like whatever happened to Lin Biao. There was only one place in Hong Kong where foreigners, including journalists, could occasionally interact with Chinese officials, a social event run by Percy Chen, a well-connected pro-Beijing lawyer. There were also these, these odd gatherings that were organized by a guy named Percy Chun called the Marco Polo Club which had um, a lot of sort of PRC types resident in Hong Kong. People from the Bank of China, the New China News Agency, Xinhua. Uh, many of them were, intelli in fact, intelligence officers. Or, 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 and, and, uh, and that was the way sort of foreigners and the, and the Chinese interacted in Hong Kong. In Beijing, John Burns struggled to make his own connections with ordinary Chinese. The tale most often told about covering China at that point during the Cultural Revolution was how restricted we were. But I discovered the bicycle. I could go out in the evening and cycle either down the hutongs, the old alleyways of the city, or out into the countryside to a village. It was also accessible to somebody who 
in those days, in my case, was a runner. Um, and I started running uh, early in the morning and late at night. And I learned an extraordinary amount of things because there would be others running at night, Chinese. And everywhere in the world there's a great fraternity amongst runners. And you could team up with somebody and run for an hour uh, and learn a lot about the town, about the city, but about the society as well because uh, there's this basic sense of trust. Sometimes Burns' daily runs through the capital provided chilling insights. I can remember running early one morning. Uh, it wasn't the only time uh, past um, the uh, state security ministry's offices, uh, headquarters, and hearing volleys of gunfire. And I was sure I was listening to executions. Six o'clock in the morning, uh, just a volley, sometimes followed by a single pistol shot when Mao himself died and we began to learn the truth. Of course, it turned out to be exactly that, that they were executing people. In August 1974, Richard Nixon had been forced to resign because of the Watergate scandal. Gerald Ford became president. Ford retained Henry Kissinger as Secretary of State, and in November, Kissinger flew to Beijing. Rebuffed in all previous China visa requests, Joseph Lelyveld managed to switch places with the New York Times State Department correspondent when Kissinger's plane refueled in Tokyo. When he got to Tokyo, we'd arranged for Bernie Gwertzman, who was the State Department correspondent, to get off the plane, and I got on the plane as the faux State Department correspondent of the New York Times, and the, we'd outmaneuvered them. They couldn't do anything about it without stopping Kissinger, because it was Kissinger's plane. And, uh, and the Americans had agreed to it, so they had my passport, and I went in with the whole bunch. But with Joe and Lai suffering from cancer, Kissinger made only a courtesy call on Joe at the hospital, and the two sides still at odds over U.S. support for Taiwan, American hopes of a diplomatic breakthrough did not materialize. Joe and Lai did not appear. He was visited in the hospital where he had a very uh, showy bandage around his head, as if he had just had brain surgery or something. And uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping appeared out of nowhere and, uh, and took his place at the, at the Great Hall of the People on the first night. That was pretty dramatic. And Deng, to whom Zhou Enlai had given day-to-day -day responsibility for foreign affairs, was blunt and tough. He criticized Kissinger for pursuing detente with the Soviet Union and failing to deliver on promises to break relations with Taiwan. The only concrete result of the Kissinger trip was an invitation for President Ford to visit the following year. In the spring of 1975, Orville Schell, a young Harvard-trained sinologist, got on a trip to China with a group of 20 American left-wing activists. Schell, though, was writing for The New Yorker. Joe and Lai, at that point, was trying to kind of affect some, put some real muscle tissue on the U.S.-China relations, so he asked, uh, uh, a friend of mine to organize a, a youth work delegation. And I went as a youth worker, but in fact I was writing for The New Yorker. Shell hadn't told the Chinese he was a writer. When they found out, there was trouble. When they learned I was writing for The New Yorker, this created an immense amount of static. And at one point, when I, we were working at Dajai, the model agricultural brigade in, in Shanxi province, they became so exercised about the fact that I was a, a writer that I remember there was a reason, but it wasn't a very profound reason. They, they told me that I wasn't feeling well and that I would be spending a few days in my cave. We all lived in caves in, in the Shanxi Lus Hills. And it was pretty disconcerting, but it was my first intimation of what it was, it was like, or could be like in China, to run afoul of the man and to be, uh, you know, in this very mysterious way for crimes you're not quite sure what they are, you've committed, you were ostracized. And then finally, a few days later, they decided, well, they'd have to let me out. Shell was part of a new generation of China reporters that emerged in the mid-1970s. Most of them were based in Hong Kong. Fox Butterfield, who'd also studied Chinese at Harvard, took over the New York Times Hong Kong Bureau from a frustrated Joseph Lelyveld. At first, I was filled with trepidation. I mean, I was almost scared the first 
few months when I was writing these stories, like this is going to blow up in my face and I'm going to be completely wrong because we are speculating based on you know, a few people's understanding of what's going on and we're hypothesizing and we're not able to go there, we're not able to see it, we're not able to touch it, we're not able to do what reporters normally do. Richard Bernstein moved to the British colony for time. A young couple, both also educated at Harvard, Jay and Linda Matthews, arrived as well. She was working for the newly established Asian edition of the Wall Street Journal, he for the Washington Post, following in the footsteps of the Post's veteran Asia correspondent Stanley Carno, a goal Matthews had had since college. By the time I was 19 years old, sitting in Cambridge, Massachusetts, beginning to read the Washington Post for the first time, I knew I wanted to be the Washington Post reporter in China. And one of the great attractions was that the, the Post reporter in China then, in Hong Kong, was Stanley Carno, who was by far the best of all the correspondents there. I thought he was just amazing. Great reporter, great writer. And uh, so he was sort of my ideal. Frank Ching, who'd been born in Hong Kong and had been editing China stories in New York for the New York Times, moved back in 1974. And in late 1975, I arrived to freelance for CBS, having studied Chinese at Yale and visited the country with a left-wing American student group in 1973. Robert Elegant, who'd been following China since the 1950s, still lived in Hong Kong. Like Henry Bradshaw, Elegant's reporting had long angered the Chinese authorities, and both men remained on Beijing's blacklist. Like Joseph Lelyveld, it took help from Henry Kissinger for Elegant to finally get to China. I didn't get in China till 75 when Kissinger took me because Kissinger said that he'd asked Joe to give me a visa. I said, Henry, he didn't give me a visa. He said, you get on the list next time I go to China. The Chinese said he can't come. And Kissinger said, you're not going to tell me who's coming in my press party. No elegant, no Kissinger. So we went in. A few weeks later, President Gerald Ford arrived. Ron Nesson was Ford's press secretary. It was a difficult time uh, uh, for China because uh, Mao Zedong, who was the revolutionary uh, hero and uh, really founder of communist China, um, was very old and was uh, sick. And, uh, uh, you know, other, other leaders were, were moving up to, uh, to fill in the vacuum. The pomp and pageantry was the same, but in contrast to Nixon's 1972 visit, Ford's trip was characterized by bad feelings and diplomatic missteps, compounded by the president's own inexperience in foreign affairs. Tom Brokaw was then NBC's White House correspondent. Foreign policy, and especially China, was not exactly what you would call Gerald Ford's strongest suit. So he was kind of being led around by Henry Kissinger, and after about 24 hours in China, we all began to complain because it was uh, kind of one photo op after another. We couldn't tell what was being done. There was a lot of unhappiness about that. We were just being paraded around, and we, and we didn't know what the president was doing. And we weren't getting very good briefings. They were very, very routine. There were very tight restrictions, um, and uh, the Chinese kept total control. I got arrested because we had at least enough freedom to go wandering off but we clearly wandered off into an area they didn't want us to wander to. Uh, and so some of the local citizens came around, and before I knew it, I was surrounded and we couldn't move, and then a couple of cops came by and they took us back to the station and we had to wait there for a couple of hours while they made the requisite phone calls and then we were released. The Americans were not sure if Ford would see Chairman Mao. The Chinese would never tell you uh, what the schedule for the next day was, who Ford was going to get to talk to, and especially whether he was going to get to meet Mao Zedong. Suddenly, on the president's second morning in Beijing, came a summons. A messenger comes to uh, where the president and his party were staying, and he says, uh, okay, you're meeting Mao Zedong at 11 o'clock this morning, and you can only bring five people with you. And so... Uh, uh, we went to this meeting, and I was one of the five. The chairman could no longer control the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. His speech was slurred. His assistant struggled not only to translate, but simply to make sense of his rambling. Mao was very old and had been sick, was sick. And it what, what, what he sounded like to me was something like this. Blah, 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 blah. And then the translator 
would translate this into beautiful English uh, sentences. Later, reporters heard that the rambling two-hour conversation had ended with a Ford faux pas. And at the end of the meeting, Henry Kissinger said to Mao, this meeting has demonstrated to me, Mr. Chairman, that your time is not yet up, that you will continue to live and lead your people for a long time. And Mao, as I remember, invoked God, saying, I think my God is getting ready to call me home. And Henry said, no, no, it's not time for you to go. Ford leaned in at that point and said, Mr. Chairman, you do whatever you want to do. Henry's always trying to tell other people, well, he's talking about dying. At that point. So everybody was trying to get him out of there. The traveling press corps for the Ford trip had one unusual member, Gary Trudeau, creator of the wildly popular satirical comic strip, Doonesbury. We had all different kinds of people who would travel. Uh, I, I don't recall another cartoonist, but uh, you know, we had columnists and, uh, and so forth. And uh, as I say, uh, Gary Trudeau, uh, his comics are always uh, focused on, uh, you know, current events, let's say. And so it doesn't surprise me that uh, he would have gone on, on this trip. Mao's female interpreters, who had so impressed Ron Nesson, became the inspiration for Honey, one of the most famous characters in the Doonesbury Strip. Despite U.S. efforts to put a positive spin on the trip, Ford's visit ended with no breakthrough, the two sides unable to agree on how to move forward. The main essence of the trip was to convey to the Chinese side that President Ford was not going to complete the normalization process uh, until after his re-election, uh, which he was hoping would take place in 1976. This, of course, was a big disappointment for the Chinese because they had been led to believe by President Nixon that he intended to complete the normalization process within his two terms. Of course, he wasn't able to finish his second term, and that's why when President Ford came in. Uh, so that the Ford visit to China was a tense one. A month later, on January 8, 1976, Zhou Enlai died. His passing triggered an outpouring of national grief, compounded by fear that the resurgent radicals around Zhang Qing would seize power. Although under attack, Deng Xiaoping was allowed to deliver the eulogy. I was just starting out as a China watcher, and the death of Zhou Enlai was really the first big story that um, I'd been involved with at all. By this time, it was possible to watch Canton TV uh, in the cable and wireless building in downtown Hong Kong. You didn't have to go out to the border and set up a TV and, antenna and an antenna the way uh, journalists had been doing in the previous decade. And so every night at 7 o'clock and the days after Joe and Lai died, we would go down to the sixth floor of the cable and wireless building and we would watch these extraordinary scenes of public mourning and the funeral trying to figure out what was going on. But once the funeral was over, Mao appointed not Deng Xiaoping, but Hua Guofeng, the colorless, politically reliable former party secretary of Hunan province, to succeed Zhou Enlai as premier. And the power struggle continued. A month later, Richard Nixon returned to China at Mao's personal invitation. It was a signal of Chinese impatience with Kissinger and Ford for not moving faster to establish full relations. It was less than two years after Nixon had resigned in disgrace because of the Watergate scandal. Gerald Schechter covered Nixon's trip for Time magazine. It was bizarre in some aspects in that he had his own... We, we met in Beijing, and he had a royal welcome, and then we, we, were, we flew around. It, it was as if he were back in, uh, back in the White House and Kissinger was still working for him. I mean, it was clearly a Chinese effort to show that um, they wanted to normalize, that they respected him, he was a friend of China, and forget about Watergate, let's get on with the really important things. Some members of the press agreed with the Chinese. This is what he should be remembered for. He's not. He's remembered for Watergate. He should be remembered for China. It changed the world. Within days of Nixon's departure, the radicals escalated their campaign against Deng. Wall posters appeared on university campuses, denouncing him by name for taking the capitalist road. 
With political tension growing on the weekend of the Qingming Festival in early April, when the Chinese honor their dead, huge crowds gathered in Tiananmen Square. They laid wreaths to commemorate Zhou Enlai, but their action was also a clear, although indirect, protest against Zhang Qing and the radicals. I remember thinking, um, this is amazing that um, people would even be able to demonstrate. I mean, it was a, don't forget, it was a very indirect uh, criticism of the Gang of Four uh, because Zhou Enlai was still uh, officially a revered person. And it was one of those rare situations. He's probably the only case of somebody that actually was able to fall afoul of, of the Gang of Four and to some extent of Mao, but whose prestige was so enormous that they, they had to live with him. And they had to live with, uh, with reverence for him. Good evening. Tens of thousands of Chinese went on a violent rampage today and rioted in Peking's main Tiananmen Square. Not since the Cultural Revolution ten years ago has there been such civil disorder in the Chinese capital. The radicals correctly saw the popular gathering as a threat. On April 5th, they sent in police to remove the wreaths and disperse the crowds. This was an enormously difficult story to cover. Uh, I was sitting in Hong Kong trying to call Beijing. It took hours for calls to go through, uh, to get through to foreign embassies and the other small number of foreigners who were in Beijing, most of whom were reluctant to talk. The best information really came from a tiny number of foreign journalists who were based in the Chinese capital. AFP, the French news agency, had a bureau. Uh, Reuters uh, had a bureau, and they had reporters uh, in the Chinese capital, but there was no footage. So this was basically a radio story, not a TV story. We have an eyewitness report from Reuters correspondent Peter Griffiths in Peking and a Washington report from Bernard Kalb, a longtime China hand. As I entered the square just before dusk, flames burst from the ground floor of a three-story block flanking the square. Masses of chanting demonstrators surged around it, and even while the flames were licking from the ground floor windows, young men higher up were flinging down furniture and sheaves of files into the street. Angry crowds turned away foreigners. U.S. specialists on China are stunned by the demonstrations. They're using words such as surprising, extraordinary, unprecedented. There's been a major political shakeup in China. The next day, Deng Xiaoping was removed from his positions. It was the second time he'd been purged in less than a decade. Later in the spring, Chairman Mao made what turned out to be his last public appearances, greeting the leaders of New Zealand and then Singapore. It was clear Mao would not live much longer. The reporters intensified preparations to cover his death. The stories were that Mao was dying and we, everyone was sort of on, on edge waiting for that, uh, waiting to hear that uh, that was happening. We had a pretty strong inkling that Mao was failing. And so the New York Times said we need a, the New York Times had a tradition of writing what we call advance obits, obituaries. And for Mao, they wanted, they were really going to do the whole thing. So they thought, four full pages of the New York Times. It was going to be the longest obituary they had ever written. And they said, uh, we'd like you to do it. And I said, well, it'll take me some time. And they said, well, just do it in your spare time. And I said, there's no way I can do that. I want to go back and read everything I can find and talk to everybody. And so they finally gave me a week. And I wrote four full pages of the New York Times with no ads is long. I mean, it's practically a book length. Piece, but I worked day and night on that. A second strong earthquake today hit densely populated northeast China, apparently causing widespread damage. Like the first one less than 24 hours before, the second one was centered about 100 miles southeast of Peking, near the city of uh, Tangshan, and was felt strongly in the nearby port of Tianjin. In late July, a huge earthquake devastated the city of Tangshan in northeast China. A quarter of a million people died. This was a massive natural disaster, but it was virtually impossible to cover. Uh, none of the very few uh, foreign journalists in Beijing were allowed to get anywhere close uh, to Tangshan. Very little information dribbled out. Uh, we were reduced to making phone calls to foreigners in Beijing. There was a Canadian student that I had met and become friendly with and I would call and got some updates about what conditions in Beijing were like because people there too were out 
uh, sleeping on the streets, and a few photos came out, but that was about it. We would go every day to the train station in Hong Kong and meet the trains coming across the border from the mainland and asked visiting foreigners, did anybody have a home movie camera? Did anybody take any pictures? But nobody did. What I remember was uh, Hua Guofeng uh, rejecting offers of aid, and things like blankets and things like that. And I remember being very shocked by that, uh, because by then we had a pretty clear sense that it was an immense tragedy uh, and that China was very, very poor uh, and uh, that there were tens of thousands of people out on the streets and they rejected aid on the, on the sort of ideological grounds that uh, China was self-sufficient. Traditionally in China, natural disasters have heralded the end of a dynasty. On September 9th, less than two months after the Tangshan earthquake, Mao Zedong died. Good evening, Mao Zedong, the man who for 27 years ruled more than a fifth of the world's population is dead. The 82-year-old chairman of the Chinese Communist Party died today at 10 minutes after midnight Peking time. It was a huge story. In 1976, I take over the Today Show. And Today Show was a little different then than it was now in terms of what we put on the air. Um, and, you know, it was early September. Uh, I get a call at 2 in the morning that Mao has died. And we just blew out the Today Show. The announcement came from Beijing that he had died. and. You know, we started filing radio uh, material. Uh, of course, everything had to be with file footage for TV because uh, nobody could get into China. And uh, so it was, um, it, it was like doing crossword puzzles in the dark. We didn't know where this was going. You were trying to do the best with informed speculation that you could, but it was, you know, throwing snowballs at the moon. By sheer coincidence, Time Magazine's Gerald Schechter was in China. He was covering a visit by James Schlesinger, President Ford's former defense secretary. We're in Tibet, and uh, we all had our oxygen to, <laughs> to suck on, and, and we're late at night. Uh, it's September now, towards the time we're getting ready to go back, and uh, we're told that Chairman Mao has died and they're sending a plane to bring you back to Beijing. And um, uh, former Se Defense Secretary Schlesinger is going to be the official American um, representative at the funeral. And all the members of the party will go to pay their respects with him. We got to Beijing and as we drove through the city, there were no cars in the streets. But people were in the streets wailing, and it was, it was a tremendous open expression of emotion, and it was as if a, you know, the head of the family had died. Um, there was this tremendous feeling of being bereft and of not knowing what would happen next. <laughs> At the funeral, Hua Guofeng gave the memorial speech in front of a million people in Tiananmen Square. He announced that Mao's body would be preserved and placed in a mausoleum. CCTV put up a signal for hours and hours uh, of uh, material on the, the funeral, and they um, just put this up, and anyone who wanted it could take it down, and that's where we got the images. And everything else we had to do telephone calls to Beijing if we could get through to somebody, uh, the uh, wire services, Xinhua. It was um, scraping whatever we could together. But Schechter was there, the only American correspondent in the receiving line. At the funeral, we were inserted into the line, mourner's line, and we all met Madame Mao to pay our respects in the and the, the other th three members. Um, and I looked at them, and I was very moved by the fact that, that they, they seemed kind of self-contented, that, uh, that this, is what they, this was the moment they were waiting for. 
And I went back and I wrote a file about this to New York, and I said just that in the file, that they could hardly wait for the, for the corpse to, <laughs> to be buried. The next morning, Schlesinger called me uh, in the hotel and asked if I would come to his room. And I got there and, and he said, well, the Chinese have complained bitterly about y your copy, in which you said that looked like the Gang of Four was trying to seize power. And uh, he said, I told them that I have no control of, over you, even though you're a guest here in China. And, uh, and basically, he, he made it clear that you know, it was an embarrassment for him, but it, it's the American way, and you just go and, write, you go and write what you want. And, of course, we discussed the fact that since the material had to be filed from the Central Telegraph Office, obviously somebody had taken a copy of my file and sent it to the powers that be, and they responded uh, very quickly with their, with their annoyance. To Schechter's intense annoyance, however, Time didn't publish his analysis. Time didn't mention anything about the Gang of Four in the, in the story. And uh, why, I, I never found out, but they, they uh, totally edited out the whole question of internal rivalry. And I guess you know, they may have thought it was unseemly to do that since such a historic figure had died. Time had missed a major scoop. But the magazine did get some exclusive pictures taken by Liu Hong Xing, who had been born in Hong Kong to mainland parents but grown up in the U.S. Liu was then a freelance photographer. He managed to get to Guangzhou for time. It was very hard to get a visa. But because I was born in Hong Kong, so for Hong Kong people to come into China, you just need the re-entry permit, which I have. I remember very distinctly that in, in, instead of seeing the, you know, people's face in sadness, what I saw was unusual, extraordinary. I sense people um, kind of relieved. Even people were wearing the black, black armband commemorating, you know, you know, or mourning Mao's death. I saw people doing Tai Chi and so on. I see all the all the body languages was a sense of relief, and yet it was rather uncertain future. Indeed, behind the scenes, the power struggle in the leadership was reaching a climax. Zhang Qing and the radicals sought to claim Mao's legacy as their own and schemed to seize total power. But more moderate figures in the leadership enlisted the support of Hua Guofeng and on October 6th, effectively staged a coup. The Chinese leadership has given its first indication that there indeed has been a purge of the country's radical faction. Photographs of Mao's widow, Chung Ching, and three other leading radicals reportedly under arrest have been withdrawn from public sale. We could never have known uh, how fragile the Gang of Four's uh, uh, situation was and that uh, so quickly after Mao's death, what it was just a month or so, after Mao's death that, um, uh, that they would be under arrest. Well, that happened so suddenly. Um, I mean, they, clearly these people had been wildly unpopular, even though they'd had what amounted to almost absolute power. And when Mao was gone, their big backstage supporter was gone. And that was, th their fall was precipitous. The campaign had been conducted mostly by wall posters and demonstrations, as Bruce Dunning reports. Shanghai, the stronghold of radical Chinese communism, appears to be turning against the four left-wing leaders, including Chairman Mao's widow, Zhang Jing. The toppling of the Gang of Four triggered an outpouring of public celebration. Unable to get into China, American reporters had to rely on accounts and occasional home movies from travelers. A Western visitor who took these pictures from a hotel window. At the same time, Zhang Qing and her followers were the targets of a venomous campaign of character assassination, most notably in a series of prominently displayed cartoon-like posters. 
and the four were quickly airbrushed out of the official photos of Mao's funeral. After the overthrow of the Gang of Four, they, are, they were cut out of all the uh, uh, tapes at that time uh, and, and photographs. And I remember uh, looking and finding a sleeve still on a photograph, like they cut out the person, but they had left part of the sleeve there. Uh, and they became non-persons. By the end of 1976, China had settled into an uneasy calm. 1976 was the year of the dragon, and it had been an absolutely unbelievable year. The death of Zhou Enlai, the Tiananmen riot, the purging of Deng Xiaoping, the Tangshan earthquake, the death of Mao, the ouster of the Gang of Four. I think as reporters, as the year came to an end, we were just kind of shell-shocked and trying to take stock, figure out what was going to come next. Yanyao 万年青